offered me one-on-one -on -one support for all my digital and marketing needs. And with their help, my sales tripled. Sign up for Shop Here to get online this holiday season. Today, done and done. Hmm, should I go get it now? Absolutely. H O T capital G U Y nineteen seventy eight at sign. Uh, no, 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 por favor, no. Just give me a moment. Come on. What is it? Hmm. Yes. So know this song that goes like Jukumi, Tukumi, 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 na 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 na. Por ti, por mí, por ti, por mí, por ti, por mí. La Rosalía, mira, quién lo diría. Hasta la esquina de esa sonaría. That's it. We detected a highly sophisticated and targeted attack on our corporate infrastructure. I didn't used to think that a foreign military would come after us, and now they obviously are. This was something that we'd never seen before. A new kind of problem. It's not just country versus country. All of us are somewhat on these front lines. It's their job, 24-7, to try to break into places like Google. Hope is not a strategy. You need a team of professionals with exactly the right knowledge and expertise. It's mildly ominous. <laughs> to do the kind of work we do, you need to cherry pick the best of the best. I might qualify it by saying I'm an ethical hacker, but yes, I'd say I'm a hacker. Definitely consider myself a hacker. 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 I wear mostly hoodies for some reason. <laughs> this is very serious. <laughs> The attacker's after something, and you want to find out what they're after. The attack happens over Christmas. Santa may arrive late this year. Someone is always rattling your doorknob to see if it's unlocked. We're constantly testing our products. Car companies crash their cars to make sure they're safe. So do we. So much more is at stake now. Human rights. Privacy. Professional life. Personal life. The entire ecosystem around an election. It's not just securing Google, it's securing the internet. I'm in this battle because I believe we can win. Hunt them down, contain them, and then put them out. Burn it down. If any attackers try to get in, I want them to have a very bad day.
When I move, you move. When I move, you move. When I move, you move. Hell yeah, hey DJ, bring that back. When I move, you move. Just like that. Just like that. Just like that. You might think of this as a search box, but it's more like a fa finder. Or an I need that look looker upper. It's kind of a what's that song solver? A thingamajig fixer. That's better. It's a brain on teaser that will tell you the length of the line in real time. You know, it's way more than just a search box. It's a language barrier breaker, a small business builder, and a group text fact checker. <laughs> Not true. It's your quarterfinal updater, a greener way to vacay, and the perfect place to stay gay. Bonjour. Search is your bona fide personal guide who can find anything, anyway, anywhere you want. Search outside the box. Did you know Google makes a phone? Don't be fooled by the outside, though. Sure, it's beautiful. Because who doesn't love beautiful? But its real power is inside where it does things other phones can't do, which is how it screens your calls for you and searches what you see. Takes stunning photos in the dark and shows skin tones as they really are. It's why it can edit annoying items out of pictures, like your ex and your ex ex. Why it can turn your nosebleed seats into courtside pics or shoot extreme close-ups and unblur faces and why it'll keep getting even better as you use it. Why, it'll even put some of that genius in your ears or on your wrist. Beautifully, of course. Introducing the new Google Pixel Watch, Google Pixel Buds Pro, and our newest Google Pixel phones. Yo, boy, you see what's going on over there? Hello? Oh, okay, Hello. I see you. Y'all wanna run? Okay, I'll see you. I'll see you. We at the park. We hooping. We need one more person who gonna pull up. Hey Google, call Candace. Already on the way. Get down. Come on, man. Who gonna fix this rim now? You got another one? has turned into a spectacular event. Hey, Nav, is that Jimmy Goldstein? Yes, but does he have one of these? This could be the best pickup game of all time. Oh! Really, bro? Okay, Team Pixel, who else want to run?
2022 earnings call. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. After the speaker presentation, there will be a question and answer session. To ask a question during this session, you will need to press star 1 1 on your telephone. I would now like to hand the conference over to your speaker today, Jim Friedland, Director of Investor Relations. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Alphabet's third quarter 2022 earnings conference call. With us today are Sundar Pichai, Philip Schindler, and Ruth Peratt. Now, I'll quickly cover the safe harbor. Some of the statements that we make today regarding our business, operations, and financial performance may be considered forward-looking, and such statements involve a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results to differ materially. For more information, please refer to the risk factors discussed in our most recent Form 10-K filed with the SEC, as updated in our Form 10-Q for the quarter ended September 30th, 2022, expected to be filed with the SEC later today. During this call, we will present both GAAP and non-GAAP financial measures. A reconciliation of non-GAAP to GAAP measures is included in today's earnings press release, which is distributed and available to the public through our investor relations website located at abc.xyz forward slash investor. And now I'll turn the call over to Sundar. Thank you, Jim, and good afternoon, everyone. Our financial results for the third quarter reflect healthy fundamental growth in search and momentum in cloud. Our reported results reflect the effect of foreign exchange. The growth in our advertising revenues was also impacted by lapping last year's elevated growth levels and the challenging macro climate. We are sharpening our focus on a clear set of product and business priorities. The product announcements we have made in just the past month alone have shown that very clearly, including significant improvements to search powered by AI, new ways to monetize YouTube shots, which will support the creator ecosystem, a strong series of hardware launches, and a new partnership and product announcements at CloudNext. These will all drive value for users, partners, and our business. We have also started our work to drive efficiency by realigning resources to invest in our biggest growth opportunities. Over the past quarter, we have made several shifts away from lower priority efforts to fuel higher growth priorities. Our Q4 headcount additions will be significantly lower than Q3. And as we plan for 2023, we'll continue to make important trade-offs where needed and are focused on moderating operating expense growth. Throughout Google's history, periods of dedicated focus have enabled us to emerge strongly and unleash new eras of computing innovation. For example, over a decade ago, focusing the company's efforts on mobile helped us to build and grow our business for the shift to mobile computing. We are at a similar point now with AI, another transformational technology. Our investments in AI and deep computer science mean that we can deliver a wide range of breakthroughs across our products and services to help people, businesses, and communities. Turning to the quarter, first our core information products. At our search on event, we shared how we are using AI advances to deliver a more natural and intuitive search experience. These advancements will soon help to surface things you might find helpful before you've even finished typing. We are also making visual search more natural than ever before. People now use Google Lens to answer more than 8 billion questions every month using just a photo or an image. Now we are supercharging our visual search capabilities to help people find what they are looking for at businesses nearby. Philip will also talk in more detail about our work to make it easier to shop on Google, a key focus. Google Lens also has an amazing translation feature. It can now blend translated text seamlessly into the background of images, like menus or street signs, in just 100 milliseconds, shorter than a blink of an eye. Through advanced language models, AI is unlocking new experiences that support more natural and conversational ways to interact with computing. Lambda is one of our most promising models for this. It's now available to demo in our AI test kitchen, which offers a way for people to experience and give feedback on emerging AI technology. 
DeepMind also debuted its most helpful and safest language model yet. Sparrow can talk to users, answer questions, and provide evidence-based answers using Google search. Moving to YouTube, another big priority. We remain focused on long-term growth for our community of viewers, creators, and advertisers. To that end, we announced some exciting changes at our Made on YouTube event last month. First, improving the monetization of shots. This is a big deal for creators and for our business. We'll introduce revenue sharing on shots early next year. This update makes YouTube the only platform where creators can monetize their content across short, long, and live formats at scale. Shots continues to show great user momentum. And we continue to invest in our mobile video tools for creators. We are seeing mobile-first creators investing more in the platform, creating content that helps the broader community grow. TV is a big area for us as well. Nielsen reported that YouTube was the leader in streaming TV viewership in the US in September for the first time. Turning next to hardware. Hardware is an important area of investment for us. We are investing deeply from the silicon to the OS to powerful software experiences because it's a big opportunity to move computing forward and build deeper relationships with people who love using Google products. It also really helps to guide the Android ecosystem beyond just building the underlying platform. Earlier this month, we introduced the Pixel 7, the Pixel 7 Pro, and the very first Pixel Watch. We've also previewed more detail about the Pixel tablet, which is coming in 2023. Pixel combines our foundational technologies, AI, Android, and our Google Tensor G2 processor to bring state-of-the-art AI directly to the device. The Pixel 7 and Pixel 7 Pro offer industry-leading photography features that can unblur or sharpen photos and shoot cinema-quality videos. We recently had our highest-selling week ever for Pixel, and I'm really proud of the positive reviews so far. Along with great devices, we introduced our latest release of Android. Android 13 offers new personalization features, improved privacy controls, and a more seamless experience with connected devices. Next, Google Cloud. We see continued momentum with Q3 revenue of $6.9 billion, with Google Cloud Platform's revenue growth rate above the aggregate. I've long shared that cloud is a key priority for the company. The long-term trends that are driving cloud adoption continue to play an even stronger role during uncertain macroeconomic times. Google Cloud helps customers solve today's business challenges, improve productivity, reduce costs, and unlock new growth engines. At Cloud Next, we unveil more than 100 new products and announced new and expanding relationships with Toyota, Prudential PLC, Coinbase, and App11. The shift to hybrid work continues with organizations evolving to support an increasingly distributed workforce. I'm proud to share that Google Workspace is now used by more than 8 million businesses and organizations worldwide. That includes Korean Air, as well as the US Army, which is transitioning 250,000 personnel to our secure communication and collaboration platform. In the past year, we have announced nearly 300 new capabilities to support hybrid work. Empowering a distributed workforce brings an increased need for cybersecurity to keep workers, data, and critical business systems safe and secure. It's top of mind for nearly every CEO I speak with, and customers including the city of Los Angeles, Roche, and Banorte put their trust in Google Cloud's industry-leading products. Our new Chronicle Security Operations Suite unifies security analytics, automation response, and threat intelligence. This has helped Vertiv analyze 22 times more security data while cutting investigation time in half. In September, we closed our acquisition of Mandiant and are proud to welcome more than 2,600 colleagues to Google. With Mandiant, we add industry-leading threat intelligence and incident response capabilities to help customers stay protected at every stage of the security lifecycle. Customers partner with Google Cloud because we offer a single platform that can analyze data across any cloud. Our leadership here is winning customers across industries, 
including the state of Hawaii and the Australia Securities Exchange. Our capabilities help solve difficult business challenges like supply chain and logistics, while also creating new growth opportunities. And as companies globally are looking to drive efficiencies, Google Cloud's open infrastructure creates a valuable pathway to reduce IT costs and modernize. In addition, with our new media CDN product for large media streaming workloads, we are helping Major League Baseball and Paramount Plus deliver flawless experiences to their customers. And with Google Cloud Edge, Rite Aid is more efficiently helping patients in their pharmacies. Across all of these areas, I'm proud of the trust and enthusiasm our customers are placing in Google Cloud. Briefly on our other bets, Waymo announced that Los Angeles will be its third ride-hailing city, joining Phoenix and San Francisco. Waymo will begin by mapping several neighborhoods in LA as it prepares to serve people there. Wing just surpassed 300,000 commercial deliveries. It's servicing new areas in Australia and announced its first drone delivery trials in Ireland. To close, times like this are clarifying. As we head into 2023, we are gonna focus on our most important priorities as a company. To support our growth, we'll continue to invest responsibly for the long term in a way that is responsive to the current economic environment. I wanna thank our employees around the world for their contributions over the last quarter. We help people, our partners and society, when we focus on what we do best and execute on that really well. Over to you, Philip. Thanks, Sundar, and hello, everyone. It's great to be joining you all today. Google services revenues of 61 billion were up 2% year on year, negatively affected by a sizable foreign exchange headwind. Search and other revenues grew 4% year over year to 40 billion, led by travel and retail, while both YouTube ads and network had modest year-over-year -year revenue declines. Other revenues were up 2% year-over-year, with growth in YouTube non-advertising and hardware revenues offset by a decrease in play revenues. Play revenues were lower due to a number of factors, including a decline in user engagement in gaming from the elevated levels seen earlier in the pandemic. Among other factors, this shift in user behavior also created downward pressure on our advertising revenues with lower revenues from app promo spend on YouTube, network, and play ads in search and other. I'll highlight a couple of other trends that affected our ads business in Q3, and Ruth will provide more detail. On the second quarter earnings call, we noted a pullback in spend by some advertisers in YouTube and network, and these pullbacks in spend increased in the third quarter. In search and other, the largest factor in the deceleration in Q3 was lapping the outsized performance in 2021. In the third quarter, we did see a pullback in spend by some advertisers in certain areas in search ads. For example, in financial services, we saw a pullback in the insurance, loan, mortgage, and crypto subcategories. There's no question we're operating in an uncertain environment, and that businesses big and small continue to get tested in new and different ways depending on where they are in the world. When it comes to how we're helping, our focus remains unchanged. The same AI driving breakthroughs in everything from protein folding, flood forecasting, and language understanding is also fueling innovation across our ads products. Via insights, automation, and easier to use advertising tools and formats, we're helping businesses stay agile, build resilience, anticipate the future, and show up for customers in more connected, visual, and consistent ways. We're helping them understand demand, deal with inventory challenges, increase loyalty, and much more. In challenging times like these, advertisers are carefully evaluating the effectiveness of their budgets. Search tends to do relatively well in such an environment, given its strong measurability and focus on delivering ROI. It's also well suited to quickly adjust to changes in consumer behavior. And when search is coupled with our automation products across bidding, creatives, targeting, or performance max, it can drive performance even further. Let's talk retail, an important vertical for us. No matter where shoppers are buying, whether it's in store, online, or both, we have the solutions to help them deliver results wherever their customers are. Take online fashion retailer Revolve, who used its global influencer network along with our category insights and automated tools to acquire new customers at lower costs. As festivals and events returned to summer, Revolve used lower funnel solutions across search and shopping 
to engage with consumers in high demand apparel categories, helping across 1 billion in trailing 12 month net sales for the first time. And then there's Magazine Luisa, a large Brazilian retailer who embraced Omnichannel by measuring and bidding directly to store sales. Coupled with in-store pickup annotations via Pmax, Magazine Luisa drove a 38% ROAS over 30 days and has since expanded the strategy to all eligible products, including 8 million plus new offers. And whether shoppers know exactly what they're looking for or are just seeking inspiration, we're innovating to make it easier and more engaging for people to shop online across our services. From finding the best deals across all types of merchants, including 200 million plus available daily deals in Q3, to new ways to search. Now when you tape shop, followed by whatever item you're looking for, you'll unlock a visual content stream of ideas that feel just like window shopping, but online. And then there's YouTube. Not only can users now buy more products and videos, but shopping as entertainment experiences are bringing the magic of our creators to the shopping experience. Like in September, when Kylie and Kris Jenner hosted an exclusive shopping stream event to celebrate the debut of a new Kris collection for Kylie Cosmetics. And at Adweek last week, not only did we announce that product feeds are coming to Discovery, but that creators will soon be able to tag products from brands across their videos, shorts, and live streams. This means viewers can shop products seamlessly while they watch their favorite content, while merchants can drive incremental reach and engagement for free listing offers when tagged by creators that viewers love and trust. I already touched on YouTube's performance in the quarter. Let's deep dive into what we're focused on. First, we're helping advertisers understand how they can drive effectiveness with every campaign they run on YouTube. Full funnel is a key way to do this. Buying YouTube across consideration, awareness, and action allows marketers to meet customers at different stages in their purchasing journey, which we know are increasingly complex, while delivering towards a key business goal. Creative and media work together across the funnel to create new demand and convert current demand. Castlery, a Singapore furniture retailer, activated a full funnel approach as part of its US expansion. It used brand and action formats, identified its most relevant audiences, and built a robust measurement framework to boost sales and awareness, including a 65% increase in US brand searches. Castlery is using the same strategy for the upcoming holiday season. Two other areas where we're continuing to invest, connected TV and shorts. First on CTV, eyeballs keep moving away from traditional TV. On average, global viewers are watching 700 million plus hours of YouTube content on TV daily. And according to Nielsen, during the 2021-2022 US broadcast seasons, YouTube reached more viewers during prime time on CTV than any linear TV network. Brands continue to take notice. Like Instacart, who tapped into CTV to maximize its TV screen strategy for its The World Is Your Card brand campaign featuring Lizzo. It drove breakout searches for its product and above average brand lift across awareness, consideration and purchase intent. And it also engaged a significant increase in audience on top of TV with 66% lower CPMs. And then there's shorts. 1.5 billion users every month, 30 billion daily views. Engagement is strong. We've always said that we focus on building great user and creator experiences first, and then follow that with monetization over time. As of September, ads on shorts have officially launched via video action, app, and performance max campaigns. As Sundar mentioned, we also extended the YouTube Partner Program and announced our revenue sharing model for shorts creators, the first of its kind for short form content. It's early, but we're encouraged by the progress we've made this year in shorts monetization and support for sustaining the creator ecosystem. I'll close with something I've said before, and I think it's worth reiterating. Our success is only possible when our customers and partners succeed. Whether it's helping individual YouTube creators or play developers make a living, and build thriving businesses, or bringing the best across Google to our partners. Our focus on driving growth for our partners and key ecosystems remains steadfast. I'm proud that over the past three years, we've paid creators, artists, and media companies over 50 billion. In terms of how we're helping our partners innovate, I'll share two highlights. First, 
A transformative partnership with Transion, the number one OEM in Africa and Pakistan, will help it close the digital divide by doubling annual activations by 2025 and build helpful products for the next billion users. And then, in commerce, with FEMSA Digital in Mexico, we're bringing together solutions across ads, cloud, maps, ways, and beyond to bolster its data and analytics capabilities so it can better reach and retain its beverage and retail customers. On behalf of many, a massive thank you to our customers and partners for their collaboration, trust, and feedback. And another massive thank you to our sales, partnerships, product engineering, and support teams. The hard work, dedication, and ingenuity of Googlers, especially during more challenging times, is truly second to none. On that note, over to you, Ruth. Thank you, Philip. Our financial results for the third quarter reflect healthy, fundamental growth in search and momentum in cloud. Our reported results clearly reflect the effect of foreign exchange. My comments will be on year-over-year -year comparisons for the third quarter unless I state otherwise. I will start with results at the alphabet level, followed by segment results, and conclude with our outlook. For the third quarter, our consolidated revenues were $69.1 billion, up 6% or up 11% in constant currency. Our total cost of revenues was $31.2 billion, up 13%, primarily driven by other cost of revenues, which was $19.3 billion, up 20%. The biggest factor here was costs associated with data centers and other operations, followed by hardware costs. Operating expenses were $20.8 billion, up 26%, reflecting the following. First, the increases in R&D and G&A expenses, which were driven primarily by headcount growth. And second, the growth in sales and marketing expenses, which was driven primarily by increased spending on ads and promotions, followed by headcount growth. Operating income was $17.1 billion, down 19% versus last year, and our operating margin was 25%. Other income and expense was a loss of $902 million. Net income was $13.9 billion. We delivered free cash flow of $16.1 billion in the quarter and $63 billion for the trailing 12 months. We ended the quarter with $116 billion in cash and marketable securities. Let me now turn to our segment financial results. As a reminder, we provide fixed foreign exchange revenues only at the consolidated level and by geographic region. All segment revenues are reported on a gap basis. Starting with our Google Services segment, total Google Services revenues were 61.4 billion, up 2%. Across our advertising revenues, the year-over-year -year deceleration in growth rates versus the third quarter of last year was largely driven by lapping very strong performance, most notably in search and other revenues. Additionally, the year-on-year -year deceleration on YouTube and network reflects a pullback in spend by some advertisers, as we first noted last quarter. In terms of the revenue lines, Google search and other advertising revenues of $39.5 billion in the quarter were up 4%. YouTube advertising revenues of $7.1 billion were down 2%. Network advertising revenues of $7.9 billion were down 2%. Other revenues were $6.9 billion, up 2%, reflecting several factors. First, subscriber growth in YouTube Music Premium and YouTube TV continued to drive ongoing strong growth in YouTube non-advertising revenues. Second, we delivered solid growth in hardware revenues, primarily from sales of the Pixel 6a. Finally, the growth in these two areas was offset by a year-on-year -year decline in play revenues, reflecting a slowdown in buyer spend due to a number of factors, including lower engagement levels in gaming compared with earlier stages of the pandemic. In terms of costs within Google services, TAC was $11.8 billion, up 3%. Google services operating income was $19.8 billion, down 17%, and the operating margin was 32%. Turning to the Google Cloud segment, revenues were $6.9 billion for the second quarter, up 38%. 
GCP's revenue growth was again greater than clouds, reflecting significant growth in both infrastructure and platform services. Strong revenue growth in Google Workspace was driven by growth in both seats and average revenue per seat. Google Cloud had an operating loss of $699 million. As to our other bets, the, for the third quarter, revenues were $209 million, and the operating loss was $1.6 billion. Let me close with some comments on our outlook. Our results in the third quarter reflect an increased headwind from foreign exchange, given the ongoing strengthening of the U.S. dollar versus last year. Excluding the revenue benefit from hedging, there was a six-point headwind year-on-year, -year, or five points with the hedge benefit, compared with a slight tailwind in the third quarter of 2021. Looking to the fourth quarter, based on strengthening of the U.S. dollar quarter to date, we expect an even larger headwind from foreign exchange. In addition, as we have previously said, the impact of foreign exchange is greater on operating income than it is on revenues, given that our expense base is weighted more toward the U.S. with most of our R&D efforts located here. Turning to our segment results, within the Google Services segment, search and other revenues had healthy fundamental growth in the third quarter, which was affected by the impact of currency movements. As I already noted, the largest driver of the deceleration in year-on-year -year growth of search compared with 3Q21 was lapping the outsized growth in 2021. The sequential deceleration in the year-on-year -year growth of search in the third quarter versus the second quarter was also driven by lapping, with an additional headwind from pullback in advertiser spend in some areas. In YouTube and network, the de sequential deceleration of year-on-year -year growth in the third quarter versus the second quarter primarily reflects further pullbacks in advertiser spend. In the fourth quarter, the very strong revenue performance last year will continue to create tough comps that will weigh on the year-on-year -year growth rates of advertising revenues. Within other revenues, we expect an ongoing headwind from the slowdown in buyer spend on Google Play due to a number of factors, including lower levels of user engagement in gaming that impacted results in the second and third quarters. As Philip mentioned, among other factors, this shift in user behavior was also a headwind to advertising revenues, with lower revenues from app promo spend on YouTube, network, and play ads in search and other. Turning to Google Cloud, our results reflect momentum across GCP and workspace. Customers globally are adopting our products and services to digitally transform their businesses. We are excited about the opportunity, given that businesses and governments are still in the early days of public cloud adoption, and we continue to invest accordingly. We remain focused on the longer-term path to profitability. In terms of profitability, we have an effort underway to ensure we redeploy investments against our most compelling opportunities. As we noted on our second quarter call, our actions to slow the pace of hiring will become more apparent in 2023. With respect to Alphabet headcount, we added 12,765 people in the third quarter, including more than 2,600 of those joining Google Cloud as part of our acquisition of Mandiant. As in prior quarters, the majority of hires were for technical roles. In the fourth quarter, we expect headcount additions will slow to less than half the number added in Q3. Within this slower headcount growth next year, we will continue hiring for critical roles, particularly focused on top engineering and technical talent. Turning to CAVEX, we continue to make significant investments in technical infrastructure with servers as the largest component. Thank you. Sundar, Philip, and I will now take your questions. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1-1 one, one on your telephone. To prevent any background noise, we ask that you please mute your line once your question has been stated. Our first question comes from the line of Eric Sheridan 
of Goldman Sachs. Your question, please. Thank, Thank you very Sharon. much. Maybe two questions, if I can. Um, so, Nora, first, you know, I think what investors are very curious about is how much this change in terms of aligning investment against your priorities is a reflection of what you expect to happen over the next six to 12 months uh, in the broader macro environment versus a longer term perspective of maybe maximizing for productivity and efficiency. Would love to get your philosophy on that. And then, Philip, um, a lot of comments in there about YouTube and the potential for growth going forward. Can you go a little bit deeper on what you're seeing in terms of both the opportunity set to drive revenue and turn a, a possible headwind to a tailwind with respect to shorts and connected TV over the medium to long term? Thanks so much. Thanks. Look, I would say uh, it's a combination. O obviously, as a company, over time, you know, we have had uh, periods of uh, extraordinary growth, and then there are uh, periods where uh, I viewed it as a moment where uh, you take the time uh, to optimize the company to make sure we are set up for the next decade of growth ahead. I view this as one of those moments. Uh, it gives us a chance to make sure we are, with clarity, identifying what are the most important areas and, and making sure we are directing our incremental investments towards those and as well as where we can uh, realign. Uh, so I view this as an opportunity to do that and, and also being responsive uh, to the current macro environment we are seeing. Yes, and from my side, uh, Eric, in the third quarter, uh, as I mentioned, there was a further pullback in spend uh, by some advertisers across both uh, brand and direct response. But overall, I feel YouTube remains in a really good position uh, to continue to benefit from the streaming boom um, in direct response. We think there's a lot of room um, to run to make really YouTube more shoppable, more actionable um, from video action campaigns to product feeds, app campaigns, live commerce features. Uh, advertisers are turning to YouTube to convert intent into action and, and really drive performance at scale. Uh, product feeds are coming to discovery ads soon and uh, recent expanded to shorts. Uh, we were already seeing results. And uh, in fact, on average, uh, video action campaigns with product feeds saw an over 70% increase in conversions uh, on shorts versus those without. Uh, on the brand side, uh, as I said earlier, eyeballs are moving away from linear TV and uh, we're helping brands move beyond tradition no, let's, to efficiently really achieve their reach uh, and uh, awareness goals. And obviously, you mentioned that as well, connected TV is an important part of this strategy. Uh, when you think about it, YouTube is really the best place for advertisers to reach uh, new consumers across multiple formats uh, and screens from shorts to long form podcast music uh, all the way to CTV. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brian Nowak of Morgan Stanley. Your question, please, Brian Nowak. Thanks for taking my questions. I have two. The first one uh, for, for Sundar or Ruth. You know, Sundar, just to go back to the, the comment about earlier in the quarter becoming 20% more efficient. I thought tonight your comment on investing responsibly over the long term of being responsive to the environment is helpful. But if I look at sort of the Excel sheet, I think you'll have added about 51,000 new people to the company since the start of last year. Can you give us some examples of internal KPIs or quantifiable analysis you're running just to ensure you're generating ROI for investors from all your hiring as you sort of run through these analyses? That's the first one. And the second one, uh, Philip, just on shorts, are you seeing shorts lead to incremental time spent from those users, or is it more so you're, you're seeing the time shift from other forms of YouTube over to shorts? Uh, Brian, I, I think, uh, look, I think we gave uh, some, uh, we've been clear that we are going to moderate our pace of hiring uh, going into, 20, uh, into Q4 as well as uh, 2023. Uh, I think, you know, we are, uh, you know, seeing a lot of opportunities across a whole set of areas and every time uh, you know talent is the most precious resource so uh, we are constantly working to make sure everyone we've brought in um, you know is is working on the most important things as a company and particularly so and that's a lot of what uh, sharpening our focus has been about uh, we are reviewing projects, you know, at all scales, uh, pretty granularly uh, to make sure 
uh, we have the right plans there and and based on that the right resourcing and and making course corrections and this will be an ongoing thing uh, it is something we'll continue doing uh, going into 23 as well Yes, and to the second part uh, of the question, as we discussed before, we've always focused on building a great user and uh, creator experience first, uh, followed by increasing monetization over time. Um, we, we continue to experience a slight headwind to revenues uh, as Shorts viewership grew as a percentage of total YouTube watch time. And uh, as I alluded to earlier, uh, the initial progress on Shorts monetization has been encouraging, and we're focused on closing the monetization gap between Shorts and uh, long-form content on YouTube over time, uh, and uh, more specifically, consumers are uh, increasingly, increasingly consuming short form video. Uh, we're seeing this across multiple platforms, uh, including YouTube. Uh, and as I said earlier, shorts are being watched uh, by one and a half billion plus logged in users uh, every month. Great, thank you both. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Doug Anmuth of J.P. Morgan. Your question, please, Doug Anmuth. Thanks for taking the question. Um, Ruth, you highlighted momentum in cloud and growth accelerated in 3Q. Are you seeing any changes in cloud demand as existing or potential customers perhaps rethink their priorities? And then how should we think about the pace of investments at cloud going forward? Do you still... Uh, believe that you're in more catch-up mode or should we expect a more stable rate of investment and greater profit improvement? Thanks. Uh, thanks for the question. Yes, we, we are pleased with the ongoing momentum. Um, it's across a wide range of industries and geographies, and it really comes back to the team's focus on, on helping them solve unique business issues and innovate in new areas as they digitally transform. I think, you know, to, more to your question, and we talked about this about last quarter, in some cases, certain customers are taking longer to decide, and some have committed to deals with shorter terms or smaller deal sizes, um, you know, which, which we attribute to more challenging macro environments. Some are impacted due to reasons that are specific to their business. But overall, as you can see from the results here again, um, we're pleased with the momentum in cloud and do continue to be excited about the long term opportunity. So that's why I made the comment in, in, that we do continue to uh, invest meaningfully in this business. Um, we're still focused very much so on the path to profitability and, and free cash flow strength here, uh, but we are continuing to invest in the business. And this fits within uh, Sundar's overall comments um, as, as we're looking at how we prioritize. And they're certainly making sure they're focused on every element within their business, but fundamentally to the heart of your question, we're continuing to invest here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Nathanson of Moffitt Nathanson. Your line is open, Michael Nathanson. Yeah, thanks. Senator, I one for you and then one for you, Ruth. Um, I want to ask you about TikTok, but not as it relates to YouTube, more about search. Um, it looks like younger consumers are spending more time on TikTok searching for product reviews, recommendations, advice. I'm interested in learning if you've seen any changes in your search behavior by demographics at Google. Um, and then do you think search has to become more visual, less text-based going forward in order to maintain more relevance for younger users? So that's one. And then, Ruth, can you kind of just dig in a bit? on the OPEX growth in Google services. You called out other cost of revenues being up 20%. It looks like as a percentage of revenues, it's, it's nearly an all-time high. So can you talk a bit about how much of that cost base is fixed versus variable and anything on outlook and what's driving um, kind of the spike this quarter and maybe what we expect going forward there on the cost of revenues? Thanks. Look, I, I think it's always important that we uh, try and understand our user segments and their needs uh, so that we can make sure the products are helpful and working for them. And we, we ourselves conduct thousands of studies a year uh, to understand how user needs are evolving. And as part of it, uh, you know, um, there are some studies which obviously show people, particularly younger users, in certain categories, maybe fashion inspiration as an example, uh, look for uh, more visual ways to engage. And so these are all learnings we are constantly taking in and we use it to improve search. And you know, if you saw search on, uh, we had uh, many, uh, many explorations and product directions which 
which uh, which move in that direction. So I think it's a healthy way of uh, iterating and innovating to build the best products and services for our users. And then in terms of your question regarding margins, uh, two parts really. On other cost of revenues, the biggest driver of the year-on-year -year increase in other cost of revenues does continue to be data centers and other operations. The change really here this quarter in Q3, the second largest driver was hardware, and then CAC moved from its usual number two spot down to number three, and there were really two key factors for the change in the rank order between hardware and CAC. Um, probably pretty self-evident, but just to spell them out, the year-on-year -year decline in YouTube ads revenues obviously muted the growth in CAC, and then the growth of Pixel phone sales due primarily to the launch of Pixel 6a drove that shift. What we're looking at overall, sort of to your broader question about profitability in Google services, is the overall pace of investment and how we're looking at um, uh, how with the change, mix change and ongoing opportunities to drive revenue growth, how it flows through all the way to Op Inc. growth. And so to Sundar's opening comments, and as we've been talking about, you know, some of the margin upside last year was due to timing issues with the very strong growth of revenues. Then there was a lag in investments. Um, and what we're focused on here is how do we continue to manage on a go forward basis to deliver durable long term results. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Ross Sandler of Barclays. Your question, please, Ross Sandler. Hey, guys. I hate to beat the dead horse on the Google services margin, um, but Ruth, you just mentioned mix shift. I think that's a lot of what's going on here. And given the trajectory that you're seeing in search and in play, which we estimate are where most of the profit's coming from in that segment, versus some of those lower margin items, YouTube subscription, hardware, et cetera. Um, maybe you could help frame the next like couple of years. Is this gonna land below pre-pandemic, which I think was around where we are here at 32%? Could we see the 2Q20 low of 27% for Google services margin? Any help just framing where that might land would be helpful. Thank you. Well, I'll, I'll, as I'm sure you would expect, leave the modeling to you, but there are two elements of it. And I think Sundar and Philip really talked about the first part, which is the ongoing opportunity we see with search, with YouTube, with some of the actions that we're taking. The opportunity with AI applied to both, the opportunity as we continue to um, build out monetization on YouTube Shorts in particular. So we're continuing to focus on both the numerator, you know, the, the driver here, revenue, as well as... Um, the investments that we're making and want to make sure to send our comments about sharpening our focus that we are economizing, um, utilizing resources as effectively as possible. So, you know, it's both, it is both uh, the efforts we're taking around expense management and building for durable performance, as well as the efforts we're taking, which are in the investment line, but drive top line performance. I would say, you know, I, I, we also contextualize it, and I tried to do that um, in response to, to Michael's questions. And we said this last year, we've noted it, um, that some of the margin upside last year was due to timing issues. And we had a very strong growth in revenues, a surge in revenues, and a lag in investments that we said was a timing difference. And you are seeing some of that here. But to the main point, we're looking at both what we can do to continue to support long-term revenue growth, but while doing so, being mindful of the pace of investment. I'll leave the modeling to you. Thank you. Our next question comes from Brent Thiel of Jeffries. Your line is open, Brent Thiel. Ruth, uh, on the pullback by uh, some advertisers, is there a common thread that you can you can draw on common you know uh, underlying characteristics that are pulling back versus those that are continuing to lean forward? Can you talk about that dynamic and what you're seeing? Uh, why don't I start and then I'll pass it to Phil for a bit more color potentially, um, because I want to make sure that one of the comments that we made in in the opening comments was was very clear, which was the year year on year story in ads was really lapping 
the very strong third quarter. And um, so to get to your question, you're really talking about sequential decline on year on year growth. And I think what's notable, you know, in, in search, um, we had really healthy growth in Q3, um, excluding the impact of foreign exchange. The sequential deceleration in search in the third quarter versus the second quarter was, again, primarily driven by lapping. And just I want to make sure that that was clear. There was um, some pullback from advertiser spend in in some areas. Philip noted that in opening comments. And then in YouTube and network, the sequential deceleration um, of year-on-year -year growth in both the second quarter and in the third quarter versus the second quarter was really further pullbacks in advertiser spend. Yeah, that's exactly right. And as I said earlier, in search and other ads revenues, um, while lapping the outsized performance was the largest factor in Q3, we did see some advertiser pull back uh, in certain uh, areas in search ads. And I think the example I called out was in financial services, um, in uh, the areas of insurance, uh, loan, mortgage, uh, crypto subcategories. And uh, we also noted a pullback in spend by some advertisers in YouTube and network. Uh, and uh, these pullbacks in spend increased uh, in the third quarter. And we also noted lower revenues from app promo spend on YouTube and network. Thank you. Our next question comes from Mark Mahaney of Evercore ISI. Please go ahead, Mark Mahaney. Apologies, we'll need to go to the next uh, question that comes from Maria Rips. Maria Rips of Canaccord, your line is open. Please stand by. to see if there are technical difficulties. Thank you all. And if the operator could keep us posted here, maybe even try yes, it. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for your patience. Again, our next question comes from Mark Mahaney of Evercore ISI. Mark Mahaney, please okay. go ahead. Just checking. Can you hear me? Thank you. Hello? We can hear you, Mark. Thank you. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ruth. Um, okay. Two questions, please. Um, one, Sundar, you've been with the company for a long time. You've seen these cycles before. Can you put any context as to the, you know, the, the, as um, economic conditions wax and wane, uh, the impact that has on Google? Like, how does this environment look to you versus prior cycles that the company has managed through? And then, Ruth, um, on the cost side, um, I understand the comments. We understand the comments about uh, you know the headcount uh, ads and, and what you plan to do in the fourth quarter. But could you talk about non-headcount related costs and you know the opportunity you see or the need you see for managing those down? And do you see that there are significant opportunities to do that as well? So again, non-headcount costs. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thanks, Mark. Uh, well, a couple things. Um, you know, I, I think. Uh, compared to the past, I think uh, going through this, I mean, there is, as we have said before, uh, there is more uncertainty as we go through. Uh, we definitely see indicators on both sides, uh, so that makes it uh, makes it a bit more unique. Uh, number two, I would say the strength of search, both as a product for users uh, as well as for advertisers, uh, in terms of delivering ROI. Through a tough time in the ad market, I think I think uh, you know is uh, is uh, is great to see. Third, just like it, it, you know when we went through it last time, uh, you know it ahead of us was a decade of mobile and the opportunities it brought. And to me, uh, sitting now to looking at uh, all the work that's going on in AI, uh, we've been an AI first company for the past. Uh, you know, uh, seven years and all the investments, and it looks like a, 
big opportunity ahead. So keeping all that in mind, focused on the long term, uh, using this moment to be disciplined and prioritize and focus, I think will set us up well for the next decade ahead. And then in terms of your second question, yeah, I think the core to Sundar's comment is um, with the rapid pace of growth that we've experienced, we see opportunities to focus more. And that drives opportunities to redeploy amazing talent we have into the highest priority efforts that we have and to be you know, as effective and efficient um, as possible. There are obviously, to your question, non-payroll associated expenses that also then attach. And so, you know, an operating environment like this adds urgency to prioritization. We want to make sure we're using all resources as effectively and efficiently as possible. At the same time, as we've tried to be very clear, there are um, very exciting areas that we will continue to invest in. And so... Part of this is you know, resource optimization, constraint optimization, however you want to describe it. We want to free up where we can to ensure we have capacity to invest as needed in opportunities that deliver these durable long-term results that we've talked about. And so we're trying to be um, uh, you know, smart about re redeploying where we can, finding efficiencies where we can while still investing for long-term growth. Thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Sundar. Thank you. Our next question comes from the line of Maria Rips of Canaccord. Maria Rips, your line is open. Uh, great. Thanks so much for taking my questions. Uh, first, uh, you talked about strength in retail and travel. Uh, can you maybe talk about automotive advertising and whether you're seeing any signs of recovery as supply has been normalizing? And if so, how might this uh, rebound sort of compared to prior cycles? And then secondly, just on Performance Max, it seems like it continues to do uh, pretty well here. So based on your conversations with advertisers, are there any specific features or functionality uh, that you would call out as significant drivers of the product attractiveness? And uh, are there any color, uh, is there any color you can add maybe around relative ROI of Pmax? Yes. Uh, so um, th there's really no uh, additional color. Thank you very much uh, for your question. But there's really no additional color on other verticals uh, apart the, from the ones I mentioned already um, that I think we should share here uh, at this moment. Uh, on the performance uh, max side, which we touched on earlier and in prior quarters, um, and just as a little reminder, it's our fully automated uh, Google Ads campaign type um, with the most channel and inventory coverage um, that really helps advertisers deliver a better uh, RI. Um, and uh, we've been listening to feedback uh, from advertisers and have continued to roll out more features since its initial launch uh, to increase transparency and help advertisers uh, steer the automation more effectively. Uh, and there are more future updates uh, to come. Um, in July, we launched a number of new settings, uh, including seasonality setting uh, that lets marketers make uh, quite a typical adjustments for seasonal campaign bidding uh, and an optimization score setting that gives an indicator for performance improvement and gives recommendations for better results. Uh, so all in all, um, we're excited about what's ahead for Pmax, um, the further simplification of our products in general, uh, and, and frankly, the value we can uh, keep driving for businesses of all sizes, especially uh, when they need most. Great. Thanks so much for the call. Thank you. Our next question comes from Justin Post of Bank of America. Justin Post, your line. Uh, great. Thanks. I guess a follow-up about artificial intelligence. You know, first, CapEx is up 31% year over year. Can you talk about a little bit what's driving that and, and can that be pulled back a bit. Is that cloud or, or really building out the AI capabilities? And then maybe Sundar, as you think about search where it is today, and, and you have much better visibility on AI capabilities than we do, um, how how could some of those capabilities be uh, you know mixed into search? And, and when would we as investors maybe see some of those benefits? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Justin. Uh, look, I mean, I think uh, on the AI front, you know, we are uh, we are still in very early innings. Uh, we've been very good about uh, as as our research teams are making progress, bringing it into search. So pretty much, the transformer-based models, uh, including BERT and MUM, are in search now. So you know, it's it's driven a, a massive improvement in search quality. 
and and helped us extend the lead in quality over uh, other products. Uh, we are definitely using it to make it multimodal. And I think going back to some of the earlier questions about making sure search is visual, things like Google Lens, bringing visual search into uh, being able to point your phone at things and ask questions, all that you know really helps uh, set up search well uh, uh, for the future of where computing is headed. But you know AI not only affects search, it affects all our products. Uh, it makes YouTube better, ads better, and through cloud, we are bringing it uh, to other companies as well. So we'll keep that in mind, and maybe to uh, you know. So we'll keep that in mind. Thanks. And then maybe Ruth on the capex, um, where's where's most of that going to, and and how do you think about that going forward? Uh, the majority of capex does continue to be for our technical infrastructure, and as we've talked about on prior calls, servers really has been the largest driver of the investment dollars. Um, the technical infrastructure team has consistently focused on levers to improve utilization and efficiency, and they continue to do so. We are, you know, investing to Centaur's comments and building out the compute in support of all that we're doing with um, our AI teams and are excited about that. And, you know, obviously you had seen some uh, more activity earlier in the year regarding real estate. We feel good about where we are. We're um, continuing to fit them, fit out our offices, et cetera, for utilization um, in this new return to hybrid work environment. Uh, but we're trying to make sure that we're, we're doing that at a appropriate measured pace. And that's really it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Thank you, Sundar. Thank you. That concludes our Q&A session. I'd like to turn the conference back to Jim Friedland for closing remarks. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We look forward to speaking with you again on our fourth quarter 2022 call. Thank you, and have a good evening. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.